Welcome to The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day and exploring the different ways that governments and companies use tech to increase their power. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director at Privacy International. And I'm Caitlin, and I'm PI's Campaigns Officer. Hi. Today, we're joined by Ina Sander from Cardiff University. We're here to talk about the challenges of educating people about critical data literacy. At PI, we've been working with Ina for a few years now, and she's in that difficult stage of completing her doctoral dissertation while working with us to create a resource for educators who want to engage their students on the issues that this podcast generally covers, so on the wide variety of issues around tech, data, and privacy. But as anyone listening here knows, this is hard. I used to be an educator back in my early years where... You know, I'd have five lectures of two hours each over five weeks to cover just a few domains that we have to live through every single day. You know, some of the issues I was covering back then were considered relatively arcane. It was me standing on a stage with hundreds of students from varying countries and cultures, but with similar educational backgrounds and a singular educational experience. That was easy compared to what it takes now to actually educate people and to reach people. And so it's fortunate that we also have Caitlin today because she's also an expert on these things, right, Caitlin? It's a bit, a bit overblown. <laughs> I mean, I'll take it. I'm not going to say no. <laughs> but you do have vast experience trying to help people understand the issues of data and datafication and privacy and technology. And I think you would, if I put words in your mouth, come to the same conclusion as I do that this is hard. Um, I think you can't work at PI unless you think things are hard. Yeah, (laughs) indeed, indeed. Welcome, Ina. Thank you. Happy to be here. You sound remarkably calm for somebody who's at the late stage of their dissertation, but it helps that it's a beautiful day in London today. I imagine that's a contributing factor. Is there a window in the room that you're in, though? No. (laughs) So the beautiful day can't be that helpful. (laughs) Just the thought that it's 21 degrees outside is a beautiful thing. So, you know... What I find fascinating about your research is, first, you've developed a concept called critical data literacy. And second, you've accumulated a huge set of educational material that's out there in the world already. But let's first start. uh, What makes education on these issues particularly hard? Oh, I think there are many things that make it hard. I think often people are scared away from topics around digital technologies and data because they think it's very technical although it doesn't necessarily have to be. I think, you know, what you just mentioned, critical data literacy, that sort of education, it can be very technical, but it can also be more focused on societal topics, the way technology affects our lives, changes our societies and so on. And then I think the other issue is that people have sort of an issue fatigue. So there are so many things that we need to care about, be concerned about, maybe become active about. There's so many critical things happening in our societies. So I think people just think, oh yeah, the thing with data, that's not actually that relevant. Climate change is a lot more important. And, you know, of course, these other issues are very important as well. But yeah, I think that's the problem. I'm an avid reader of climate change policy and news and affairs, and I do not envy the climate change advocates because they're working in a field where people think they can do something to help stop what's going on. And the reality is individual action isn't the solution. And actually, to a large degree, that's the case in privacy too. And I imagine that's one of the areas that you've struggled with when it comes to dealing with educational content. People kind of do want the 10 tips that you can do to protect yourselves online when it's not so easy, is it? Exactly, yeah. 
I've heard that analogy a few times recently and I think it really works pretty well because both of these issues are very complex, very important and they affect so many areas of our lives and our society, politics and so on. But yeah, they're very difficult to understand and you can do things as an individual but not that much. And that is something that has been criticized a lot about literacy, especially I think in the academic world. So when you present at a conference, you talk about critical data literacy, people usually think you just talk about awareness and that's it. And I've often been asked, so what follows awareness? What should people do then? And even if you say, well, you know, you should include some constructive next steps, which I always do. So that's one thing that's very important to me that when you educate about these topics, because they're so dark and gloomy, it's always important to give people something to do as a next step so that they don't feel too powerless and resigned. But even if you do that, many people give them steps to protect their data. And that is great because there are things you can do to protect your data and you can use some alternative services and that empowers people to a certain extent. So I don't want to talk that down. I think that's really great. But I think it's important to understand that, as you said, these are systemic issues and the individual can't change it on their own. So you can do something to feel more in control of your data and it can help. But eventually what we need are systemic solutions, collective approaches, and that's just very difficult to achieve on your own. Although I want to say also here individuals can take some steps so you can get involved, you can try to get into these public debates, make your voice heard. And yeah, I think that's something that's very important to me and often overlooked in critical data literacy. Is part of the problem as well the idea of data literacy being its own issue. When you're trying to explain why critical data literacy is important or you're trying to kind of explain the issues to people, do you find people don't have the perspective of how entangled it is with like everything? Yeah, there are so many concerns that you can think about when it comes to data. And I found that some things have reached the mainstream. So things like privacy, you know, that's something people have heard about, maybe surveillance as well, but it kind of stops there. And not many people are aware with how data practices and data systems feed into discrimination, for example, and so many other societal areas that are sort of becoming more extreme through data. And yeah, I think these sort of wider, longer term implications of sharing your data or, you know, of agreeing for third parties to use your data, I think that's something that's not very clear. Yeah. So even before my PhD that I'm doing at the moment, I did a very small study with 10 students where I showed them some educational resources and I uh, looked at how this changed their privacy attitudes and their behavior online. And then I had interviews with them as well and talked about these resources. And that was an interesting finding. Some of them were very concerned and became more concerned through using these resources. But even the most concerned ones, they would say something like, oh, I know this is bad and I don't really want that, but I can't imagine what they would do with my data. So they had like a gut feeling that probably it's not good if companies so so much about me, but they couldn't grasp it, which makes total sense because I sometimes find it hard to explain to people what is it exactly. It's not just giving your data away and becoming transparent. There's so many other issues, but they're very difficult to grasp. Because I'm a bit of an old fart at this, I was heartened to hear that you say that people get privacy, but I remember the days when people didn't get those things. They didn't get privacy, they didn't get surveillance, and I think we've had the benefit of popular culture, we've had the benefit of investigative media, and uh, TV show after TV show, movie after movie, covering privacy and surveillance. Yeah, people get it now. Then there's the question, are they concerned just because they've seen the AI in Mitchells versus the machines or they've watched 1984 a few too many times? Does that educate them to the point where they're going to do something different? And what I've found is the language of, yes, your data is accumulated by these entities might not chill everybody. 
But when you say, and it could be used to make decisions about you or other people, then it concerns more people. Then all of a sudden, if you say it discriminates, then it just enlargens their sphere of concern about these issues. But I've had to take one minute to describe that trajectory to two of you uh, who understand these issues very well. How do you educate people who come into the conversation with so many different perspectives to begin with, who might be concerned about themselves, but not about others, or might be concerned, but think they ha have control, or are very concerned about discrimination, but not concerned about privacy. How could you possibly take all of those people on a journey? And Caitlin, I want you to answer that question too, because you do that every single day on the variety of things that you're working on at PI too. Well, I think there are many answers to that question, but the thing that popped into my head as a first thing is to use examples and stories, ideally from real life. So, for example, when I was saying before that many people are concerned, but they can't articulate how their data could be used, just in my own conversation with friends and colleagues, I then often say something like, okay, you don't mind if Facebook knows everything about you, but how do you feel if I tell you that Facebook uses your data to, you know, target certain ads of, you know, certain types? So, for example, fake news ads or political ads at very specific people. So, you know, micro targeting. And I give some examples on, you know, the parameters you can use to target it to a person, like their gender or their sexuality, their age, all of these questions. And when you give that as an example, in my own personal anecdotal experience, I feel like people kind of change their mind and they're suddenly thinking, oh yeah, actually that doesn't sound fair. And I don't mind if the company knows about me, but that sort of practice doesn't seem like something I want to support. So I think that's one way to do it. And that's also something that came up in my recent research now. So as part of my PhD, I've done expert interviews and also a survey with, on the one hand, people who are creating these online educational resources about data and the way it changes our lives and also with educators who cover these topics in their different types of teachings. And one thing that came up with both of these groups of people was always a focus on stories. So they were saying, if you want to bring across a narrative, you can't just tell the narrative, but you have to tell a story. And then also using examples from real life just to make it a bit more real and help people grasp it, make these really complex technical issues tangible and connect to people's lives. And I think that was another key finding in my research that is important to show people this affects them because it's so easy to say, yeah, I don't really mind. This doesn't affect me. But actually, if you use technology in any way, this does affect you. I agree with everything that you said. The other thing I think that can be a really useful tool is showing people volume. So a colleague of ours ages and ages ago, I think she decided data subject access request asked for her information from Facebook and she got a huge list of everything they knew about her and everything they'd inferred about her. So everything they'd taken her data and guessed about her. Some of it was very wrong, but one of the things that was really shocking was the volume. And I think when people see it kind of in front of them and it's about them and it's everything they have, that in itself can be quite surprising. Like no one's living their life going through and remembering every single thing that they've told Facebook and people don't realize how much Facebook is tracking them. And Facebook's just one example. It works with lots of different things, but it's a good example because you can get that like dossier. Here is everything Facebook knows about you. So I think that's a useful tool. We get asked this question quite a lot, like how do I approach my friends and family? And um, often what people are asking is how do I get them off the services that I disapprove of? And I found that that's not a helpful question to ask because often what that means is people are going to their friends and family and saying, well, Facebook's terrible. You should delete your Facebook account. And starting with Facebook's terrible is great. Like it's true. You can give them lots of examples. You can talk them through the reasons you think Facebook is terrible, but then people make that leap to you should get rid of Facebook or you should get off WhatsApp and move to a signal or you should do X, Y, or Z. And what they don't engage with is what people find useful or good about those services. And it comes back to that individual decisions versus systemic problems. Like people genuinely value some of the things they get from those places. People genuinely value and appreciate 
you know, some aspects of Facebook, there are things that they would miss if they left. So when we're talking about educating particularly people's friends, you know, sharing stories is fantastic. But when you start kind of harping at people, like, and therefore get rid of this thing you like, anecdotally, I've found that people stop listening to you. Whereas if you approach them where they are, which is, you know, maybe someone who enjoys these services you disapprove with and kind of drip feed them. <laughs> Here is another terrible thing that Facebook has done. Here is more information about, you know, the things that Facebook knows about you. Then slowly people can make their own decisions. And the really important thing is that people make their own decisions because you're never going to be able to force someone off a platform. But you can slowly change their opinion on a platform kind of over a long period of time. So meeting people where they are is... I think the hardest and most useful education tool that we as PI have. I do worry that if we tell people that the cost of maintaining their privacy is leaving the things that they love and need to do in order to exist in today's world, they will become resigned. It's kind of like going back to the environmental movement. We all know flying is bad. We all know aviation is responsible for huge amounts of pollution. But if we harp on that too much and try to tell people not to travel, and we know that people are going to travel because people need to travel, then we just, like, I would just say to myself as somebody who cares about the environment but knows I need to travel, I'll say, oh, well, nothing can be done. I'm going to travel anyways. Maybe this entire environmental movement thing is useless. This is my point. So you have to meet people where you are. You can't yell at them to just get rid of something that they like. But I guess the thing that's missing there is, you know, people need to know that flying is bad. But the other thing you can do then is advocate for more cheaper and better train travel, for example. And you direct people towards the positive thing, which might be more better enforced regulation rather than the, oh, you're terrible, get off Facebook, stop using plastic straws, whatever it is. You know, yes. like the focus can be on the empowering positive. Here is not a solution, but here is something that could contribute to a better world rather than that very specific, you like Facebook, that is bad. Yes. I'm hanging my hat on in our friendship on you exactly. like Facebook and that is bad rather than, oh, you know, here is some information about Facebook. Isn't this news interesting? Wouldn't it be better if, you know, there was stronger regulation around the things Facebook could do? Yeah. And as PI, I think that's something that we've been looking more and more at is how do we present solutions, like positive things that people can do rather than this is terrible and you as an individual aren't helpful here outside of collective action. Like you as an individual, you can delete Facebook, but that's all you can do. And also Facebook will track you anyway because you don't need a Facebook account to get tracked. Like, <laughs> And we can point people towards the individual solutions and the platforms. And we do. There are loads of guides on our website about you know, browser add-ons that can help you make yourself a bit more secure. But it all ultimately comes back to meeting people where they are rather than where you want them to be. And you can't assume people are going to make that leap and you can't kind of, you can't force them off the cliff. You can only kind of help them chisel steps down. That's a terrible and very, very tenuous metaphor. But like, <laughs> it's part of what makes it so difficult because when you're trying to find an audience, those people are at completely different places. So we talk to sometimes a very technical audience who are going, you need to tell people to delete their Facebooks. And a very, maybe a human rights focused audience who are like, just way further kind of in a different place in that journey going, oh, I didn't know that Facebook could track me without a Facebook account, like, and all sorts of other things. So we end up with this huge audience of people who are in completely different places. And I imagine that's a bit like you know, high school classes on microcosm of you've got the really technical kids and you've got the kids who, you know, have no clue, aren't that interested. The really social media focused kids who get a lot out of it, you know, who care about TikTok and, you know, young people things. <laughs> Yeah, and I think all of it, what you've been saying now, are things that also came up in my interviews, which is really interesting because it seems that, you know, the concerns or the issues you have as an NGO trying to educate your audience are seem to be quite similar to what educators in terms of teachers experience. So one thing that they were also saying was that they find it really hard to have an objective role and put their own opinion back, particularly with this topic, because I think, this is my interpretation, but I assume that those teachers 
who already cover topics like data and privacy in their teaching, they probably have a personal interest just because it's not a really mainstream topic. So they probably care and they're probably concerned. And they are saying it's really, really hard, especially if we're working with young people and teenagers to not do what you've been saying and go there and say, Facebook is terrible, delete it now. Because especially the, the young people, they really enjoy using these technologies. And I remember talking to someone who was saying, if you take that approach, they will just stop listening immediately. So they were rather trying to be very neutral and show some opportunities, show some risks and really foster a dialogue and a discussion and support the young people in forming their own opinion eventually, even though that might be an opinion where they say, okay, I've thought about everything, but I'm still going to continue using TikTok and Facebook because I still don't mind. And then it's probably difficult to hear, but then at least it's an informed opinion. And, you know, also coming back maybe to my theoretical concept of critical data literacy, I would say that's also the goal for me. So I personally find these developments around data systems concerning, but I think my goal is not that everyone finds them concerning, but that everyone is aware that this is what's happening, thinks about it, reflects it, understands what you were saying at the beginning about how many areas are affected by this and then makes up their own opinion about it. And I think it can be difficult to you know, hear that someone does these things and then still has another opinion than you. But that's, I think, for me, the right way. And that's the way I want citizens in a democracy to behave, you know, and to form their own opinions and then stand in for these opinions. Yeah, I wholly agree, except I don't want to stop at opinions. I never expect anybody to agree with me, especially on my take on, say, data and tech. But what I want at the end of this educational journey that I may have taken an audience on is that if the claims of the proponents of other perspectives are true, then everything should work. Everybody should be better off. The national security will never be an issue ever again. And all your friends will get along forever. And every algorithm will be fair into perpetuity. And my only conclusion for people is, at the end of this, wherever you stand, just be more demanding of the systems around you. You know, be more demanding. If there's a police failure and they had vast amounts of policing powers, maybe the failure was somewhere in the system, or maybe they had the wrong powers that they were asking for. Or this is constantly the issue with policing. They're always getting their new toys and not doing their traditional methods. Same with national security. Same with Facebook. There's still the question as to whether or not Facebook advertising is better than other forms of advertising. It's just Facebook has just owned the market and killed off newspapers in the process. Demand for a better world. You don't have to fall on my side when it comes to privacy and critical data issues you have to fall on the side of wanting a better world. I think that's such a great goal. Yeah, I totally agree to that. Like when I think back to how I got taught in high school and in primary school about online issues, it reminds me a lot of the drugs awareness talks we got, which was very, this is terrible. You are going to get groomed, never speak to anyone or tell anyone anything online. And that is not kind of the ecosystem that was being built at the time and it's not the way that people use online stuff now so understand the information that you shouldn't give out and is important to not give out that is useful for phishing attacks for example versus that kind of scare thing which doesn't treat kids and has never treated kids as thinking people like it's very kind of i'm right you don't know anything you're not capable of thinking this through critically here is what you cannot do. And that was never very successful, I would say, as an education tactic. But we did it all the time, though. We still do it to this day. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I think that would be something I would criticize in these online resources that I've looked at. Not all do it. Many are really, really great. But some of them, they're very good in their content, I think, but they take this approach still. So they're very dark, very gloomy, and are very much about... Oh, your data is being taken and everything's terrible and these companies are monsters and, you know, just the metaphors they're using and the language. And if it's a video, for example, the music they use, the style, the atmosphere, it's so dark. And I understand that it gets people's attention. I think it does, but I don't know if it really helps. And, you know, I really don't know. 
And the people I talked to, the experts, even they weren't clear on this. So some of them were saying this can help because you need to wake up people. You need to show them this is a serious issue they need to think about and we need to get their attention. And then there were others that saying, no, never do this because people just stop learning when they're scared. And learning always has to be fun, particularly for adults. So... I personally have become more critical of these negative approaches through my research on these. But also, I think it's not a clear issue. It's not a clear cut picture. Can I challenge you both to help me with some of my own homework? Because I have to help PI develop an educational resource for parents. So parents of kids who are getting online and having autonomy that comes with that. And I don't know if you've been reading the media lately, but for some reason, the last few weeks, there's been a lot of coverage of the types of technologies that parents can use to track their kids. Not just online anymore, but physically track them with their devices. and based on what you've just said of the inverse, which is like how to educate kids, what are we supposed to do for adults who are parents of kids? Are we supposed to say, if you track your kid, you have to understand somebody else might be tracking them. This company's going to know about them and like doom, gloom, fear, this is horrible. Or do we try to take a more evolved approach, which is your kid has just joined TikTok. You probably think TikTok is crazy. Let us explain what's going on with TikTok, but also let's explain what's going on with their data. And then maybe with the old drug parallel that you raised, Caitlin, is how to have a conversation with your kids about their data on TikTok. You know, is that what's needed? Is it a scare? Is it the condescending towards kids? What would work as an educational resource? I mean, two things spring to my mind here. And one is, again, like parents going to parent and you're not going to be able to, in one resource, change the way someone's going to parent. Some parents are going to let their kids go on TikTok and some aren't. But understanding the risks and not understanding the risks is important. I would prefer they have a conversation with their kids about those risks. But some parents are just going to ban their kids from TikTok. Some parents are going to install tracking apps. I'm not happy about that. But again... I would take that risk-based kind of information approach because parents are going to decide how they're going to parent. And it's important, you know, they have the information that they need to make those decisions. But there's a concept in the mental health space is where I've seen it called the dignity of risk, which is if you don't have any significant mental health issues, you have what's called the dignity of risk, which is you can make terrible decisions. (laughs) You can, you know, gamble, you can start terrible businesses, you can make bad decisions, and then you get the consequences and you live with them and you move on. Whereas people with significant mental health issues often aren't given the dignity of risk. So then they never get to make bad decisions because they have these mental health issues rather than being given tools to manage and deal with them. You get kind of this clampdown where it's like, well, you can't make any decisions on your own because you can't. And anything that's slightly risky that someone who doesn't have those challenges would be able to do, you are not able to do. And I think we treat kids the same way sometimes. Like kids are developing. People's brains keep developing until they're like 25 or something. And so there need to be guardrails. But at the same time, kids are learning and developing. And, you know, the mistakes that they're allowed to make in my opinion and I don't have kids so you know it could be I end up in the long run in however many years having a kid and becoming the world's biggest helicopter parent because they're terrifying and very vulnerable (laughs) but if kids aren't allowed to make mistakes ever and aren't allowed to learn from them and aren't allowed to kind of grow then I think that would make for a very sad childhood and obviously like there have to be guardrails (laughs) I'm not saying that kids should be allowed to like roam the world completely unencumbered by any kind of oversight or help. But I would urge people to lean towards the help and the managing risk rather than trying to remove all forms of risk, because then their kids will grow up and be able to evaluate risk and manage risks online rather than kind of, you know, leaving the nest and being presented with a world of significant risks and concerns about data and all sorts of other things with no tools to manage it if that makes sense. 
or does that sound insane to people who actually have kids? I don't know. <laughs> no, not at all. Like that's exactly what you want. And so I'm always introducing tech to my son with a lot of freedom, but with also a lot of explanation as to what's going on in the world around and saying, what kind of choices are you going to make as a result? But I, I, I never try the fear route. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to work out. I don't know. I really don't. Like most, most parents look at my kids' use of technology with disdain, saying you spend far too much time doing X and Y and blah. But equally, if you ever want to hear him come close to swearing, get him talking about Facebook and Google, and uh, he's really unhappy. And it's not just because I've dumped this on him. It's because I've given him the differences between companies, what companies do, where advertising comes from, and hopefully that leaves them with their own opinions. But of course, when he hits teenagerhood, he's going to rebel and like do everything wrong when it comes to privacy and surveillance. But you know, that's that's the right of teenagers, isn't it? Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think it's good to keep in mind with all the critical things that I think you mentioned TikTok before. That's also a huge place for creativity and, you know, connection with friends and expressing yourself and all of that. And discussions about privacy. Like yeah. there, there, oh, there really? are loads and loads. Oh, my days. There's an app. There's a parental tracking app called Life360. And if you go on TikTok and the little hashtag Life360, like it's loads of teens talking about how uncomfortable they are with their parents tracking awesome. every single thing that they do. That's and giving each other tips and techniques and tools and ways to manage and kind of help with their privacy. And as a side note, if you are on TikTok, Privacy International has a TikTok. <laughs> you can go look <laughs> up. <laughs> nice. Very good. So it's not all bad on TikTok. Yeah. Please don't put me in the camp of like, he's old, he hates TikTok. It was more about the media coverage of the hazard that is TikTok and how parents shouldn't let their kids get on there because they're developing ticks. And if we pile in with the, oh, and TikTok also gathers a lot of data and it's owned by a Chinese firm and all these kinds of things, it just makes us sound like the scary on the side of parents versus, as Caitlin rightly said, there are people on TikTok who are talking about the very issues we care about. We should be there engaging with them. Yeah, and maybe to come back to your question about how you should do it, I would say if you're addressing the parents, I wouldn't go for the scary route because I think especially with parents, they have jobs to work in, they have kids to take care of, they maybe want to have a bit of free time for themselves, so they don't have much time. So I would say... You know, make it easily accessible, of course, but also rather fun or interesting rather than scary. Because, you know, either you're going to get people's attention with a scariness, but then they might take that perspective and just put it on their children and the children will not listen at all because they can't be bothered with this sort of negative perspective because they like using their tech. Or the parents themselves start reading and are saying, oh, no. I can't be bothered as well, you know? So I think making it interesting, maybe using some good visuals, you know, making it accessible, breaking it down, giving some constructive advice. I'm sure you're doing all of this anyway, but I think just because you were asking about us, that would be my answer. That's actually what I'm working on right now. And if any listener wants to engage with me on this question, I would love to talk to parents who are navigating these issues and who are struggling and have thoughts on what we should be doing to help other parents who are struggling, just maybe to, even to help them understand what's going on so that they don't need to be afraid or for them to channel their energies to the right legal measures or policy issues that we need. Again, it's about dealing with it's a systemic, not dealing with the episodic thing that everybody's focused on right here, right now. That's at the end of the day, what critical data literacy for everybody, including PI staff, is trying to get at. Yeah, so if anybody wants to engage on the educational issue, or if you want to engage on the question of how to reach parents and what to educate parents on, please email me at executivedirector at privacyinternational.org. This has been a fascinating discussion. And if people want to know more about critical data literacy, but also about our own educational plans at PI, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, Ina and I are working on a resource for teachers that we'll be posting on PI's website relatively soon. And then we are also developing further educational materials on PI's site. But if you go to privacyinternational.org slash act, you can see a number of guides and other 
other educational tools that we've already created. And in the next few months, we are going to be launching a whole lot more because this is an area that is just ripe for development. Thank you so much for your time, Ina. It was so nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It was really interesting to talk to you. And thanks for doing this research. Like, you've been doing it for years, and it's so valuable to have this resource of all these tools out there so that we're not every few years reinventing the wheel and we can see what's been done out there. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Remember, you can tell us what you think of the podcast by visiting us at pvcy.org slash tpsurvey. You can sign up to be the first to learn more about our work at pvcy.org slash pod sign up. And we'll include some links to relevant articles and information in the description wherever you're listening or on our website at pvcy.org slash techpill. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you use. Music, courtesy of Sepia. This podcast was produced by Max Burnell for Privacy International. Awesome. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck on your PhD. Yes. Good luck. <laughs> okay, take care, everyone. See you. Bye. Bye.